It's Tuesday, August the 29th, and this is Photo Walkthrough Tutorial 9, Chapter 2. Hi, my name's John Arnold, and today I'll tell you about a fun group you can find on Flickr that will improve your post-processing, and then I'll show you how Michelle did some of her early textured brushwork on her gun image. I often get invited to join Flickr groups, and a few days ago, listener Neil, known as Neil Says on Flickr, told me about a group he takes part in called the Digital Darkroom. The basic idea is that members occasionally post images straight out of their camera to the group's discussion board, and ask the other members if they'd like to take a shot at post-processing it. The results are really interesting when you see how different people approach the same image. Best of all, working on someone else's image gives you a totally free hand to be as creative as you'd like. It's a good opportunity to experiment and a great way to learn. So if you're interested, take a look at the Flickr group, The Digital Darkroom. And don't forget that there's also the Photo Walkthrough Flickr group, where you can post your own images for comment and critique. There's a good bunch of people hanging out there now, and I always look through the images that have been posted there, and comment on as many as I can as well. PhotocastNetwork.com your photography resource in the potosphere. Photocastnetwork.com Last week we talked a lot about making masks, and that's probably one of the most important skills you can learn in Photoshop. But while I covered lots of different methods, I missed out two interesting ones and one really important one. So let me quickly mention those. First of all, there's the lasso tool, which you can get to by pressing the letter L or clicking on the second icon down here, just below the marquee tool. And quite simply, the lasso tool just lets you draw a shape on the screen and make a selection. Very, very simple tool and occasionally useful for adding bits to a mask. So remember, if you hold down the shift key, you get the plus thing. You can add bits to your mask that way. Or if you've got holes in your mask, oh, we've got a hole there, for example. Useful to do that. So. Also, under the lasso tool, we've got the polygonal lasso tool. Uh, this is particularly useful for images like this one. Now, you saw me yes last week cover uh, the pen tool. We could do a similar sort of thing with the lasso, polygonal lasso tool. And all this is doing is letting me draw straight lines from point to point to point, which is very useful if you've got an image like this with lots of straight edges tricky round curves like this bit here, but as you can see that's a pretty useful quick tool for selecting straight edged regions. So that's that's the second of the lasso tools I wanted to cover. Now the um, other tool that I wanted to cover that was actually really important because Michelle used this for, um, uh, for creating the masks in this image is the quick mask tool which you can get to by pressing the Q key, where you've got these two icons down here at the bottom of your tools palette. Um, and if you click on the right hand one, you go into quick mask mode. And if you grab a brush, you'll find that if you paint black, you're going to get red. And the reason for that is that you are masking out parts of your parts of your image. So if I click, th this is the quick mask button. This goes back into the regular marching ants selection. So if I go back into the marching ants, you can now see that I've got the entire image selected, except for that bit that I painted that red, red brush stroke on. So if we go back into into quick mask mode by pressing that button there, or by pressing Q, you can switch back and forth by pressing Q on your keyboard. Um, if I go back to this mode and I fill this entire screen with black, which is my foreground colour, so I do Alt or Option Delete, and then with my brush. I paint white on there. I'm now selecting the cannon by painting white on the quick mask. All of these white areas are selected. All of the red areas, uh, black areas um, on the quick mask are unselected. And you can see that because you've got control with your uh, mouse or with your pen, you can sometimes get extremely accurate selections with that. Now, particularly areas like these 
bars here you might want to grab a, a small brush and zoom right in. Now I'm, I'm using quite a soft edge brush here you can see there's a graded edge on that. If I do shift greater that, a uh, shift square bracket, right square bracket I can make that a hard edge brush like that and I can now work along those hard edges with my brush and paint in the mask very precisely indeed. So if I just do the tip of this little spike here, I want to cover this quickly because this isn't what the today's show is really about. This is just stuff that I meant to cover last week and it was an extremely long show. I didn't get around to covering it like I wanted to. So I'll just do this one little spike here and you can see what I'm trying to show you. Used a hard edge brush and I'm just painting white on those areas that I want selected. Just switch to black for a moment just to fit in a little corner there. Um, let's just finish off just by doing that little bit there. Oh, missed. Okay. So if I now press Q again, you can see we've got marching ants just around the top of that. Um, top of that little spike there and that is one of the main ways I use ma to create masks a, a lot of the time usually what I'll do is use some of the techniques I showed you last week just to generally block in lots of areas of the image and then when it comes down to the very detailed work where there are edges that uh, maybe the select by color range tool can't get I usually go in on the quick mask um, and go in and manually paint those masks in. Uh, alternatively, sometimes what I do is I go into the layer mask and paint on the layer mask in much the same way. So uh, masking, extremely useful, and you'll see uh, it later on in today's show uh, how you might use masking to only affect the bits of the image you want to affect. So um, another thing that I briefly mentioned there is the Select by Color Range tool. So Select by color range. I don't propose to show you that today. I will. I will cover that at some point. But that's yet another extremely useful way of selecting regions of an image based on what color they are. So moving on. The next step that Michelle used in creating her image was to boost the contrast and sharpness on the Canon itself. Now, last week we created this copy of our background layer and we created this layer mask that selects, in this case actually everything except the Canon. Remember white selects and black uh, deselects. So uh, if we wanted to use this layer that we created last week to create the same effect, let's just look at, at Michelle's version of that. Um, this is the very bottom layer of Michelle's image and you can see it's got that layer mask but it's got white where the cannon is and black where the uh, background is so we'll just do that by selecting our background uh, our layer mask on our layer and we'll press Control I to invert that uh, or Command I on a Mac um, so we've got the same layer mask now and I'll just turn that off and turn Michelle's layer on and off and you can see what that's doing let me zoom in a little bit so you can see a little better what that's doing is it's darkening and adding contrast and adding sharpness. You can see some texture coming up here just on the Canon. And the reason it's only happening on the Canon is because of that layer mask. So coming back to our own layer, we've got the layer mask already. We've got a copy of our background layer. So let's just do the same things. Uh, now normally you'll see me do things like um, uh, curves and layer levels on a separate layer. It looks like the way Michelle did it here was to do them on this copy of the background layer. Uh, that's fine. Um, it's not very back outable. You can't go back and modify these changes later. So uh, if you want to do these things on separate layers, I do recommend that. But obviously it'll make your file size a bit larger. So that's one of those things you need to make a, a judgment call on. So with this layer, layer selected and, and with the actual bitmap of the image selected, not the layer mask this time, I'm going to go to Image Adjustments Curves. And I'm going to just start off with a little S curve, which will add contrast to the add contrast to the canon. You can see straight away that's starting to go in the right kind of direction. It's more contrasty. It's gone a little bit darker. So we'll take that as our curves change. And we'll also do image adjustments levels. You can get to this also by pressing Control L or Command L. And I'll just drag the highlights down because we've got some highlights that seem unused there. And we're going generally darker. So just drag in the midpoint higher up, which means we're getting more in the darker end of the tone range, 
which will tend to darken the cannon up a little bit. And finally, I'm, I'm racing through these because this isn't really what I want to show you this week. This is this is um, simple stuff, so I'm, I'm, I'll come back and cover things like how to sharpen nicely in a different tutorial. But um, just quickly again on the unsharp mask, um, I find 50% in here is a pretty useful sort of range. And my very quickly racing through my sharpening, if you're going to use unsharp mask, um, you've seen me do a different sharpening technique in the past, but if you're going to use unsharp mask, I drag the amount right up, sort of anywhere between 300 and 500, something like that, and then I drag the radius until you're, in, drag it up high, and you start seeing lines around the edges of things, really very clear lines. Drag them down until the radius is small enough that you're not seeing those sort of halo lines around things. Let's just look at that. Yeah, you can see, I don't know how easy this is to see on a video. If you look along the edge of that metal uh, bracket there, you can see a light blue halo along the left-hand edge. So I'm going to drag the radius down until that halo just about disappears, which is somewhere around about the 1.2 1, 1 pixel range. There is just a little bit of lightness to the left there, but I think that's actually in the image. It doesn't seem to vanish no matter how much lower I make that. So I think around about the 1.2, 1.3 pixel range is good for this image. That radius will vary depending on what the resolution of the image is. So just be aware of that. Um, and also I should mention I keep the threshold down at zero when I'm doing this. Now once you've picked the right ra radius, I tend to drag the amount down to somewhere in the region of 100 to 150 percent. And it's just this is just now a judgment call based on how gritty you want the texture to look. And in this case I want it to look sort of moderately gritty. So I'm going to go for about 125 percent. Threshold will take out if you've got noise being sharpened and we have just there on the bottom of the cannon so I'm just going to drag the threshold up. Don't want to drag it up too much sort of three or four tops. And that might also mean you need to drag your amount up a little bit. That's looking a bit better. So I'm going to accept that because this isn't really a show about sharpening. Um, and that is our uh, reproduction of Michelle's first, la first layer. You can see that's adding quite a considerable amount of grit to that. I think actually I might back that off a little bit with the opacity slider just to make it less of a significant edit. That's pretty good. I probably ever did the sharpening, but you get the idea. So, moving on, let's let's look at uh, brushes and grunge layers. Um, let's start off by looking at Michelle's first grunge layer, and I'll zoom back out so that you can see what it does. I'm going to turn on and off this layer so you can see what it looks like. Um, first of all, we've got sort of an interesting sort of cauliflowery brainy pattern up in the top corner here sort of carries on down we've got a lot of uh, noise and just ge general texture appearing here and if you look also at the light levels around the bottom of the cannon and just generally around the cannon as I turn this on and off you can see she's added quite a lot of what essentially amounts to, to burning uh, sort of dodge and burn style, style burning around the bottom here just to sort of keep the lights uh, even and give a little bit of shape to the cannon. So that's the kind of effect we're going for, but it's a bit hard to see that. So let me show you something that's very useful. When you're working on dodge and burn layers and when you're working on texture layers like this, it's really useful to create a grey layer. So I'm going to make a new layer. I'm just hitting the new layer icon down here, and that's going to go above the, the layer we just created, and I'm going to fill it with mid grey. So I'm just clicking on my foreground colour. I'm just going to dra grab a 50% grey, or near enough, there we go, 50% in the brightness there. Press OK. And then on this layer I just created, I'm going to do Alter Option, Delete, and fill that layer with grey. So that is a completely grey layer. And now if I turn on and off Michelle's grunge layer on the top, you can see much more clearly what it is we're trying to achieve. You can see the texture here, you can see this cauliflower here, you can see where she's done some burning you can see an awful lot more of what we're trying to achieve. So that grey layer there, extremely useful for letting you see the effect of what you're doing. Now before you before you move on and start doing your texture, 
do remember to go back and choose black and white as your foreground and background color because it's going to confuse the heck out of you when you start painting gray over a, over a gray layer it's going to look like nothing's happening and you're not going to know why so go back to black and white because you're going to want black as your foreground color for doing a lot of these edits so with our gray layer selected we can see what we're trying to achieve here and I'm going to make another just empty layer where we're going to try and reproduce much of that effect now every week I talk about using the brush tool but I've never explained which brush I actually use usually you see me working with a soft edge circular brush and that's what I use 99% of the time but you can actually choose other brushes up here and this list here is a list of brush presets and as you can see we've got an icon and then a representation of how it might look if we were to draw using that brush and what this is showing us is on the left it's showing us our brush tip shape and then on the right it's showing us an example of how that brush stroke might look if we started off pressing lightly on our graphics tablet and then got through to pressing completely hard and then letting it lighten off again so you can see my default brush which is this 125 pixel wide brush here as I press lightly it's a very light brush and as I press hard it goes through to black and then as I lighten off again it goes back to white again or, or transparent by default you'll find that this brush is this brush is my own de design of brush by default you'll find it's probably one of these brushes you get where it's a circular brush with a slightly soft edge it's, it's a sort of a um, an anti-aliased edge um, anti-aliasing just means choosing midway uh, pixels between the black and white so if you're painting black you don't want the edges to be either black or transparent you want the edges to sort of blend in nicely with the image so you might have some grey pixels around the edges so you'll find that by default your brush will change size depending on how hard you press and I'll show you today how to create a brush like that that you changes opacity depending on how hard you press so this is a very useful window for choosing preset brushes but it doesn't really give you any capability to change those brushes so you've got the brush tool selected you can also press this button up in the top right corner here that will bring up the brush palette here now this is a lot like the window you just saw it's got all the same preset brushes available in it but it's also got some extra configuration options on the left here but before I go into covering those I want to quickly show you David Nagel series 5 brushes that Michelle used in distressing this image and uh, I'll put a link to where you can find those in the show notes um, but if you press this button up in the top right corner of the palette there's this load brushes option here and you can see there I've got Nagel series 5 brushes which I'm just going to press load and that will append those brushes to the end of my list so these down here now are those Nagel series 5 brushes now if you find you want to reorder this list I think it was Holly that emailed me and told me about this um, if you go into that top right menu again preset manager opens up and you can see all the brushes that you've got and you can drag them around and if you want to drag something to the start you can if you want to drag something back down you can reorder them to your heart's content so press done on that and all my Nagel brushes are at the bottom here now so this wonderful cauliflower shape that we got on the left I happen to know it was this brush here that Michelle used to create that so I'm just going to drag the brushes palette out of the way so that you can't see it but it's just off screen and I'm going to hide Michelle's layer and I'm going to start painting on our new texture distressing layer this is our grunge layer number one and I'm just going to start painting in up here and you can see that's giving us that sort of cauliflower texture that we wanted let's just see whether or not I can get a slightly larger texture that's about it so let's back that off and just to that now there are some really interesting textures in this uh, in this brush set some nice grainy texture there I'm just choosing random random brushes here let's drag down some wonderful sort of uh, uh, given us sort of canvasy feel to the image so let me just drag these brushes out of the way again and you can see what that actually does I'll turn off that gray layer and you can see now I'm going to make this an overlay blending mode rather than normal an overlay will make it so that 
Uh, anything that's darker will darken the image. Anything that's, anything that's darker than mid-gray will darken the image. Anything that's lighter than mid-gray will lighten the image. So a bit like soft light, but uh, a stronger effect. So we're going to go for overlay, which I think is the blending mode that Michelle used. Yes, it is. It's overlay at 100%. So go back to ours, overlay at 100%, and you can see that texture starting to come up in the corner there. And if you look carefully in the middle, you can see that the area where I was painting that sort of... Um, canvas texture on the middle there is starting to show there. So very useful brushes for changing the texture of an image. Um, I'm going to turn this grey layer back on because I want to just make sure that when I undo this I'm undoing all the bits I want and I'm going to leave that there. Now let's just look briefly at these other options in our brushes palette. So let's just start from the top and work down. The brushes presets are the presets you've already seen, and these are brushes that are designed by other people, and we can see how, they look, how they're going to look when we do a stroke uh, with our pen. Um, the next step down is the beginning of starting to make your own brush. So first thing you're able to choose is your brush tip shape, and there's all sorts of tip shapes available. And that one is the, uh, the regular 125 wide pixel soft edge brush. Let's just turn off some of these options. So you can see that's just a straight soft edged brush, 125 pixels across, and we can change the diameter of that here, and we can change how hard the edges of that are here. And if we want to, we can change the spacing. That's how often it's going to draw the brush tip on the page. So if I drag that spacing right up, and then draw a line, you'll see we get separate dots. You can see each individual brush tip being drawn. If I drag that down to a smaller number, you can see that's sort of dotty now, but sort of starting to join up. And if I drag it all the way left, we get a nice smooth line. So just undo those steps. And I tend to keep the spacing around about the 25% mark. That gives a nice performance and a good solid line. Obviously, the more of these it draws, the thicker and, and wider this is going to be because we've got a soft edge brush and it's, gonna, it's painting over the top and over the top and over the top the more often it's drawing the brush head. But there comes a time, around about there, look, 30%, it starts to separate up. You start being able to see the individual brush heads being drawn. So 25% is a nice, nice value for uh, keeping the line solid. So let's go and grab another brush. Let's grab our regular 125 pixel brush and play with some of these other dynamics. Um, if I go down to shape dynamics, this size jitter here allows you, it's a bit hard to see there, let's turn off the other dynamics, allows you to say, I want it to randomly vary the size of the brush head as I, as I draw the line. So if I drag that size jitter up to 100% and then draw a line, you can see it's varying in size. And if I was to change the spacing a little more so you can see the individual dots, you can see it's choosing random random head sizes uh, along the line. And there's lots of configurable options on, in, in the brush palette here that let you do things like that. You can say how big you want the minimum size of that jitter to be. Um, if you had a brush that was, a, that was a, a, a different shape, let's choose something like that. I can also go in here and say I want it to vary the angle of that. And I can say how much I want it to, to allow it to vary. So I can do a sort of a, a grass style brush like that, where all the little grass blades are at slightly different angles. And say how much we want it to vary the roundness. And that's, that's the width to height type ratio. So we can say, oh, well, sometimes I want it to draw it a little bit taller. Sometimes I want it to draw it a little bit wider. And there's lots of these configurable options on here. By default, you're going to find that this control slide, this control drop down here, is set to pen pressure for size. And what that will do is it will say, if I press lightly, I want it to draw small. If I press hard, I want it to draw large. It's hard to see with that brush. Let's go back to 125 pixel brush. If I make this pen pressure here, and I'll turn off the other dynamics for a minute, you can see this is how it might normally look. And if I draw a line, let's undo some of those steps. If I draw a line, pressing lightly here and we're getting a small brush and as I press heavily I get a larger brush and as I lighten off I get a smaller brush again. I don't particularly like that way of working. I think that 
that doesn't give me the control I want when I'm photo editing. Usually what I want to do is layer in things and, and use lower opacity when I'm pressing lighter. So I turn off that pen, pen control there. And the opacity pressure is on, in other dynamics. So we've got an opacity jitter here and I can change it'll it'll vary and random randomize the opacity of the individual brush heads as they're painted by doing the opacity jitter there and here is where I choose pen pressure so if I was to turn that off it would be the same pressure all the way if I turn on pen pressure I can have it so that I can do a light line a heavy line and a light line again and I can vary how hard I'm pressing and how how how, how opaque the brush is going to be as I draw so those are a couple of very useful dynamics to start with. The next one I want, the, the last one I want to show you probably for today is is the texture. Um, let me undo those two brushes that we've drawn. Um, now, you can choose in this drop down here a texture to draw with. Normally you're just painting with a solid color, but if you want to choose a texture, let's choose that one because that's kind of an obviously visible texture for now. Let me draw here. You can see we're drawing with that texture. And if I'd make it larger, you can see that the actual texture gets larger on the page as I draw. So this is quite useful when you want to add in something like noise. Let's get rid of those. Now I've created a pattern here. This is just a noisy pattern. And I'm going to drag my scale down to 100%. And what I'm drawing with now is just you can see it here it's just black and white pixels and all I did to do that let me show you how I did that I'll drag the brushes palette out of the way and let's just do a file new very quickly 100 by 100 press OK and I'm going to fill that with black I've just got black in the foreground option delete to fill it with black and then I'm going to go filter noise add noise and we get the add noise window up here I've dragged the, the amount slider all the way up to 400% and I'm just going to press OK. And you can see that's given us a nice noise pattern in there. Now if I go to Edit, Define Pattern, and call it, uh, let's call it John's Pattern 1. I can close that now. No, I don't want to save it. And back in here, back in my brushes palette, I've now got John's Pattern 1 there, which is the pattern I just created. So much the same as the, the, the pattern next to it to be honest with you um, pattern next to it it's more grey so let's which one do I fancy let's go with the one I just created right so that's we're now painting with this this pattern as our texture so now when I paint black with I'm still using a soft edge let me go back into my brushes palette you can see that I'm still using a soft edge ground brush and I've still got a, a pressure sensitivity to change how opaque that brush is. It's just that that round brush is painting a pattern, painting a texture. And I can now lightly paint in that noisy texture here. But I don't want to do that just yet. First of all, let's just go back and quickly look at Michelle's layer. I've just undone all of those changes. Let's turn our layer off and turn Michelle's back on. Can you see just in there we've got the outline of some of the bits and bobs that were in the uh, in the image. You can see the outline of the cannon just there. You can see the outline of one of those uh, fence posts there. And the way Michelle's done that is when she came to her layer to paint those things in, she used a, layer, uh, a, a, a selection to only paint in the areas that she wanted to paint in and not paint in the areas that she didn't want to put the texture into. And we've got that layer mask down here already. So if we control or command click on that layer mask, it gives us the marching ant selection. Now remember we've got white is the bits that are selected and black are the bits that are not selected and actually where I want to paint are outside of the cannon. So at the moment we've got the cannon selected, I want the opposite of that. So if I go to select inverse, we now got, you can see the marching ants around the top, we're now selecting the bits that are not the cannon. And if I turn off that grey layer, you can see that selection is going outside the cannon. Now if I want to paint that texture in, I've still got the same brush selected, I'm still painting with that textured brush, and I want to start painting that noise in. As I paint over the cannon, let's turn my grey layer back on, you can see I'm not painting inside that 
canon area I'm just painting in all the selected bits so that's extremely useful um, if you don't want this texture to apply to a bit of the image just use a selection to mask off the bits that you don't want to paint on and you can paint with impunity across them and nothing will happen so let's take that grey layer off I'm just going to back those changes off because they're a little bit too harsh and I'm just going to paint in a little bit more texture here oh. To go back onto overlay mode. Don't know how I lost that. Um, just painting in just some texture here. I'm just trying to reproduce the sort of same effect that Michelle had. So we've got that nice cauliflower there. We've got some sort of texture coming up here. Just going to use the eraser a little bit just to back off some of the some of the texture there. Don't want it to go all the way to the edge. I'm just trying to make it sort of parchment-like. And the final step to this is uh, a regular, oops, a regular dodge and burn. And I'm going to just lose that selection by pressing Control or Command D. And with my brush, I'm going to grab a regular preset brush, my my own preset brush, 125 pixel pressure sensitive opacity black brush with a nice soft edge. And I'm just going to burn in some of those areas that Michelle had burned in herself. She darkened down this ground here because really we want the focus on this image to be on the cannon, not really on the ground. The ground is quite light, so I'm just lightly painting black over the ground there on this overlay layer. You need to be a little careful. This is basically the same as, dod as burning, um, and this overlay layer is going to make a very effective dodge burn layer, so I, I need to be very careful not press too hard because. If I do, it's going to be a really strong visible edit. I've, I've gone too far there, so grabbing the eraser tool, just erase the black a little bit off that layer and just back that change off a little bit. So, if I turn that layer on and off now, you can see we've, we've darkened the ground. We've added a little bit more shape to the cannon just by darkening down some of these areas on the wheel and on the front of the wood here. We've got texture appearing in the sky here. We've got a bit more texture appearing uh, in the background here. And I think we're starting to come a little bit closer to the effect that Michelle had. That's Michelle's version. And that's my, that's my version. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. There's an awful lot more that I can cover on brushes. But for the time being, I think I fit you with enough information for today. Um, I will catch you next week um, with a little bit more information. And then I'm going to be taking a week off while I'm in Germany um, helping Chris Marquardt to teach his photography workshop. So I uh, will see you next week. Uh, and I'll cover as much as I can then. Until then, have a good one. Photocastnetwork.com, your photography resource in the potosphere. Photocastnetwork.com